Good afternoon and welcome to the Environmental Law Institute. You have joined us for the Summer School Series Seminar, Law and Policy of Products Regulation. My name is Chandler Randall and I'm the Manager of Educational Programs here at the Environmental Law Institute. And I am so delighted to welcome everyone to ELI's annual Summer School Series. I encourage you to join us every Tuesday for Summer School and for more information, please see the events page of our website, eli.org. At the end of today's panel, we will have time for a Q&A session so please submit your questions through GoTo's question box and please do not wait until the end. Send us your questions as soon as you think of them. I would also like to thank our outstanding panelists for joining us today to lend their expert expertise to summer school. And while they will be introduced briefly, the full speaker bios are posted on our website, www.eli.org. And I strongly encourage you to check out their expertise in more detail there. But as we begin, I would like to just briefly introduce today's panelists. Lynn Bergeson is the managing partner at Bergeson and Campbell PC and is a leading expert on this topic. Lynn has earned an international reputation for her deep and expansive understanding of the laws governing chemicals and pesticides. Alexander Dunn is partner at Baker Botts LLP. He previously served as the assistant administrator for the US Environmental Protection Agency's Office of Chemical Safety and Pollution Prevention in which she led the agency in the creation of national policies implementing federal laws governing chemicals, pesticides, and pollution prevention. And Angela Howe is the legal director for the Surf Rider Foundation. And leading the organization's legal strategy, she fights for sustainable solutions to environmental challenges and works to increase surf riders' impact for healthy coasts. And Angela earned her law degree from UC Berkeley. Lynn, Alexandra, and Angela, thank you all so much. We're so glad to have you here. And with that, I would like to warmly turn things over to Lynn to get us started today. Thank you all so much. Thank you, Chandler. It's a pleasure to be here. And I want to welcome everybody to this discussion, um, this overview of the law and policy of products regulation. As uh, Chandler indicated, I've been doing a lot of uh, work over the many decades I've been in the practice of law, focusing on chemical product law and regulation. My job today is to spend about 25 minutes providing a broad overview of the two federal statutes that control chemicals. Um, the Toxic Substances Control Act, which controls industrial chemicals, and the Federal Insecticide, Fungicide, and Rodenticide Act, fondly known as FIFRA, not FUFRA, not FIFRA, FIFRA, which regulates in agrochemicals. And in, uh, uh, industrial uh, biocides and uh, agri agrochemicals. All right, I'm going to spend just a minute talking about what we're not going to talk about because this space, the chemical product space, is really pretty crowded. There are many other federal statutes and a host of state regulations that similarly control chemical products. For example, the Federal Hazardous Substances Act is the federal law that controls the labeling of commonly used household products. We all are familiar with the Consumer Product Safety Act and its 20,008 amendments, the Consumer Product Safety Improvement Act, CPSIA, which interestingly, for those of you that really want to dig into this space, has specific provisions regarding certain chemical products like lead and phthalates and um, other um, provisions dealing with toy safety. The which controls um, um, a whole host of trade acts, but also the green guides control the environmental um, provisions relating to marketing claims like recyclability and non-toxic. Um, then there are a host of, of very prominent state statutes, the California Safer Consumer Product Regulations, for example, the California Cleaning Product Right to Know, um, New York has a similar household cleaning product information disclosure program. Uh, and as I noted, every state has its own consumer protection law, which to varying degrees also regulate uh, chemical products. Uh, I was on a conference call this morning dealing with the Illinois Detergents Act, which controls um, consumer and industrial products that have uh, detectable levels of phosphates uh, uh, in them and phosphorus. So. I don't mean to um, emphasize what we are not going to focus on, but I do mean to focus on 
we are dealing here today with just a narrow sliver of the many federal and state regulations and uh, legal statutes that apply to chemicals. All right, let's start with the Toxic Substances Control Act. As you know, um, or as you may know, it was uh, first um, passed 45 years ago in 76, the same year that the Resource Conservation Recovery Act was uh, implemented into law. It was very significantly amended uh, five years ago um, with the Frank R. Lautenberg Chemical Safety for the 21st Century Act. Um, TSCA was intended when it was first signed into law to provide um, opportunities to fill in gaps left behind other federal statutes. Uh, TSCA, you know, came a little bit later or quite a bit later than most of our traditional environmental statutes, including Clean Air, Clean Water, uh, Safe Drinking Water Act, uh, was entered into law the same year as the Resource Conservation and Recovery Act dealing with uh, hazardous substances and, of course, Superfund. Uh, it is just one of a uh, compilation of federal laws intended to regulate chemicals, as we just indicated. It uniquely focuses on industrial chemicals or chemicals that are not considered either uh, pesticides or uh, products that are regulated under the Federal Food, Drug, and Cosmetic Act. Um, the new TSCA, as we refer to it, as or called Lautenberg or um, and there are any number of, of ways you can refer to the 2016 amendments, dramatically changes how TSCA is implemented and what industry is expected to do as a consequence of their manufacture, import, uh, use or processing of an industrial chemical. Now, what are the primary purposes of TSCA? Um, I think if you think about what Congress intended TSCA to do, it helps you think through um, the rights, duties, and obligations of the entities regulated under TSCA. Um, it is certainly intended to require industry to develop adequate information, including toxicological and environmental fate data with regard to the products uh, and chemical products that a, a manufacturer um, manufactures and puts into commerce. It is intended to regulate chemical substances, neat chemical substances and mixtures that are believed to possibly present an unreasonable risk of injury to human health and the environment under these very specific conditions of use and to allow EPA to take actions to mitigate or prevent unreasonable risk to human health and the environment. Um, another primary purpose of the law is to remind uh, entities that the regulations implemented under TSCA uh, should not unduly impede or create unnecessary economic barriers to technological innovation a provision that is not really in, enforceable per se, but is intended to reflect Congress's intent that TSCA regulation not impede technological innovation or unduly create economic barriers to it. Okay, let's talk about what a chemical substance is. And I neglected to mention at the beginning that both of the laws that I'm going to talk about are implemented by the United States Environmental Protection Agency um, and its regional offices, okay? It is, these statutes are not delegated to the states. FIF are a little bit different if you have a, a, a state program that meets certain provisions. Uh, state agencies are intended to enforce it, but by and large, these are non-delegated federal statutes. So those of us that spend a lot of time, Alex um, and, and me, for example, uh, we're in Washington because that's where most of the action is with regard to the implementation policy law and um, uh, regulatory uh, developments with respect to TSCA and FIFRA. Okay, chemical substance is intended to include industrial chemicals that are not otherwise regulated um, under other federal statutes. Remember, TSCA was a gap filling statute, and by the time TSCA was signed into law back in 76, the Federal Food, Dark, and Cosmetic Act already regulated food additives, drugs, cosmetics, and preparations, and of course, FIFRA was uh, long in effect at that point regulating agrochemicals. It um, applies to manufacturers of neat chemical substances, which includes importers. So even though a chemical is manufactured offshore, you are considered a manufacturer of that substance when it enters the, the United States. 
It also um, includes uh, processors of chemical substances. Processing meaning anything that you do to a chemical substance. Okay. Um, what are some of the major changes that uh, we, right now, even though TSCA was um, amended in 2016, we are still living through seismic change in the interpretation and enforcement of TSCA uh, as a result of the 2016 amendments. Uh, so some of the major um, policy uh, drivers of the changes back in 2016 um, first off, EPA is now under a mandatory duty to evaluate existing chemical substances with enforceable deadlines. When TSCA was first implemented in, in uh, 1976, there was no infrastructure mandating or compelling that EPA do anything with regard to existing chemical substances. Those chemical substances that were being marketed and distributed in commerce back in the, in the, the late 70s. Uh, so under new TSCA, uh, EPA has a very regimented program to review, uh, evaluate, and mitigate unreasonable uh, risk imposed by uh, or identified by a risk evaluation process that must take place within certain dates. Uh, EPA is also required to assess chemicals against a risk based safety standard with no consideration of non-risk factors, including economic costs and uh, other non-risk uh, um, measures. That is contrary to what uh, EPA was authorized to do under the first law. Uh, unreasonable risks that are identified as a result of EPA's reviewing uh, existing chemicals must be eliminated. Um, under old TSCA, there are significant um, risks might not be um, addressed or even identified uh, because of the way the cost benefit risk evaluation process occurred under the old law. EPA under the new law also has significantly expanded authority to compel the production of toxicological and environmental fate and other data. Under the old law, EPA was required to engage in a lengthy rulemaking, which ultimately um, didn't seem to work very well, which is why EPA now has unilateral testing authority under the new law. The new law also requires EPA to make affirmative risk determinations with regard to new chemicals as a predicate to their entry into the marketplace. Uh, under old TSCA, EPA was merely required um, to demonstrate that a, well, actually EPA only had to determine that a new chemical did not um, have a well, new chemicals were required to enter into the environment in the absence of any adverse findings. So EPA is now required under the new law to make affirmative findings with regard to whether a chemical substance uh, is capable of posing an unreasonable risk. Uh, EPA also has much more authority uh, to substantiate or to require entities to substantiate um, uh, confidential business information claims. Um, this has long been a subject of concern in the regulated community. Uh, manufacturers under the old law were required or were authorized to withhold the disclosure publicly of, of certain chemical information. It's much harder to do that now in the universe of information that can be um, claimed CBI or confidential business information is much smaller and the regulatory burdens of maintaining those assertions much greater. Uh, also EPA is, re is authorized to seek um, enhanced fees uh, to support at least um, a portion of the cost of administering the TSCA program. Uh, so the fees over the last several years have been significantly higher than the $2,500 um, per PMN fee that was um, assessed under the old law. So the new law is very similar to FIFRA in that it's kind of a pay to play um, if you have submissions um, to the agency. I'm gonna spend just a little bit of time um, on the key provisions of TSCA in a very broad overview kind of way because we don't have time to, to uh, go through TSCA in any detail. But there are lots of different provisions under TSCA that authorize EPA to compel the submission of information because information and data really um, are the lifeblood of any statute, particularly those like these product laws, TSCA and FIFRA. So TSCA has many different authorities given to EPA to compel the submission of information under Section 8. A very prominent one is TSCA Section 8, Chemical Data Reporting, which is a reporting requirement every four years 
that requires manufacturers and importers to submit information that allows EPA to track what chemicals are in commerce and what quantities and according to what uses. EPA can also compel the submission of health and safety information, uh, which it does under 8D, and any entity um, subject to TSCA has a requirement to uh, submit adverse effects information. So EPA has a good check on information of which manufacturers and importers are aware that could suggest a chemical poses an unreasonable adverse effect. Once that information is submitted to EPA, EPA uh, reviews information. It also reviews information on TSCA Section 4, which authors, authorizes EPA to compel chemical testing, as I mentioned a bit ago. EPA now has expanded authority to compel chemical testing by way of a unilateral order, which it did not have under the old law. So you can imagine a combination of chemical test information um, and information submitted under Section 8 gives the agency lots of information to review and make determinations as to whether a chemical substance or class of substance might be in need of certain risk mitigation provisions. So the risk management on existing chemicals, that's TSCA's authority under Section 6. Under the new law, EPA is now required systematically and seriatim to review all active chemical substances listed on the TSCA inventory, which has been maintained, as I mentioned, since the late 70s, to determine whether any poses unreasonable risks uh, during conditions of use. So the risk management system that EPA has under the new law is very much an evolving system. Um, Administrator Friedhoff made uh, certain announcements as recently as June 30th regarding how that process will be unfolding um, with regard to the chemicals the agency is now reviewing and will continue to review until all so-called high priority existing active substances have been fully evaluated for purposes of determining whether any poses an unreasonable risk. Um, EPA has to prioritize that process as that was one of the drivers EPA uh, was tasked with doing between old TSCA and new TSCA. The old law didn't have any incentive or infrastructure to review the 45,000 or so active existing chemical substances. The new law changes all that. So there's very much a regimented system in place to identify, evaluate, and um, establish risk management provisions for any existing chemical substance believed to pose an unreasonable risk during a condition of use. Um, I'm going to quickly go over some of these slides because I wanted to already be into FIFRA and I'm not right now. Um, let me shift over to um, EP has special provisions with respect to a class of chemicals called persistent bioaccumulative and toxic chemicals. Under the new law, EPA was able to forego a risk evaluation process because PBTs are presumptively determined to pose certain risks such that a risk evaluation process is not necessary. EPA did that and issued a final rule just earlier this year, uh, which has been causing all kinds of interesting problems that Alex might share with us uh, when, when she is um, on your screen. New chemicals are very, um, subject to very different provisions. Uh, we have pre-market approval of existing chemical or new chemical substances. EPA has a very well-defined, well-oiled machine for evaluating the risk of, of new chemical substances. Uh, the process is um, as set forth in these uh, slides here. I'm not going to go into them in any detail, but I think the takeaway message is that under TSCA section five, new chemical substances are subject to very strict um, evaluations and protocols, um, entities that are wishing to validate a new chemical substance and make it amenable for commercial use need not generate data to support that cause because EPA has models that simulate risk under various uh, conditions of use scenarios. But many entities do submit information to help corroborate their belief that new chemical substances meet the safety standard that EPA applies when reviewing and um, uh, authorizing new chemicals to be considered existing chemicals, adding them in the inventory, and uh, then you're off to build your market with your new chemical. Uh, with regard to TSCA, 
implementation issues and ongoing issues for those of you that might be considering a career in product law. There is no dearth of topics in it from which to choose. Um, some of the challenges that I think the EPA has in, um, encountered over the last five years is the fact that we've had three changes of administration. So policy uh, and, and interpretations of any new law are challenging, and that's particularly true when you have three different administrations doing the interpreting. There's lots of litigation ongoing with regard to um, TSCA, new TSCA. Uh, too much to go into here, um, but there's a lot of dispute as to what Congress intended and what is the best way to go about evaluating existing chemicals um, evaluating new chemicals and, and meeting the new standards set forth under the new law. Uh, the new chemical review process has been just a hot mess for the last five years in no small part because what is a condition of use? What is a standard against which um, uh, new chemicals should be measured and viewed um, are all issues that continue to evolve. Uh, alternative testing strategies as um, Congress expressed a desire to uh, remove or minimize or move away from animal testing as the European Union has for many years. So what is considered a, a validated alternative new chemical um, or new testing strategy is very much in play. The, as I said, the risk evaluation process is very much in play right now because of differing opinions as to what um, a risk is, what is an unreasonable risk, which is an undefined term under TSCA. Uh, lots and lots of things going on. And finally, just operational changes in general, um, resources, staffing, institutional capacity. How does the agency keep abreast of technological developments with regard to new chemical and existing chemical management? These are all issues that EPA has done an excellent job of managing, but continue to challenge um, an agency that is overworked um, and probably at some level understaffed, um, but I know the new administration is addressing this and focusing significantly on task implementation. Let me pivot real quickly to our other federal product law. This is the Federal Insecticide, Fungicide, and Rodenticide Act. It is similarly administered by EPA uh, in Washington. Um, not quite yet in one place in Washington. I think EPA still is over in Crystal City, um, Virginia. But at one point soon, it will be united with its uh, counterpart on Pennsylvania Avenue. Um, several states have really mature parallel state statutes, including California, New York, Florida, among others. Um, so when if you're in this space and if you're wishing to have a new chemical approved as a pesticide, you need to worry about the federal program under FIFRA, but you also have to worry about very mature programs in New York, California, California, and a growing number of states that have taken a very significant interest in the review and approval of pesticides in their jurisdiction. What is a pesticide? Well, it's any substance or mixture of substances intended for preventing, destroying, repelling, or mitigating any pest. And those are magic terms, uh, the terms of art under the law, and the intent is an important um, code word here because if a chemical, and lots of chemicals do have dual uses, you can have a chemical regulated under TSCA and a chemical regulated under FIFRA. They just won't be regulated by both at the same time. They're very use and application specific. Um, a substance is considered to be intended for a pesticidal purpose that requires registration if the person who distributes or sells the substance claim states or implies uh, that the substance uh, should be regulated as a pesticide. So a pesticide might not even have an explicit pesticidal claim on the product labeling, but if you um, intend for that or imply for a pesticidal functionality, you've just invited yourself uh, a seat at the FIFRA table. Uh, the scope of, of uh, the law covers active ingredients. That's the magic pixie dust that is usually in very small quantities and formulations. If you go to your uh, Walmart or Home Depot and you want to buy a, an anti-roach product, for example, uh, you usually see that it's at 0.5 or 0.1 percent. That's the active ingredient. That's the uh, chemical that provides the uh, pesticidal functionality that does the killing, the mitigating, or the repelling. And then everything else in the formulation is considered inert. 
uh, probably a little bit of a misleading term because some of these chemicals might not be inert, meaning devoid of any type of biological functionality, but they can have a biological functionality that equals that of the active, or they'd be considered an active and not an inert. But that combination, that mixture in the formulation in the bottle or in the nurse tank or in the airplane, if it's an aerial application, that's the pesticide product. And there are a whole bunch of different ones under FIFRA. There are the conventional ones that you might think that you apply to corn or soy or what have you. There are minimum risk pesticides, pesticides that are believed to pose very minimal risk and hence are given a special status under the law and are treated differently and less rigorously because of the minimal nature of their environmental impact. Uh, biopesticides, a growing area um, in the market for sure. Uh, biological pesticides are also thought to have less of an environmental footprint and hence have a, a less of a data set required in order to get into the market. Antimicrobials or, or uh, biocides um, are another area of pesticide law that continue to enjoy very significant action, particularly in these COVID days, because they are antiviral agents, uh, impose other or address other types of bacterial or vir viricide types of, um, of pests and treated articles. These are all special categories of pesticides. Um, real generally, uh, pesticides like FIFR require pre-market approval. The uh, risk-based safety standard is divided between no unreasonable risk for non-food uses and reasonable certainty of no harm for food uses. Uh, so you have two different standards there that are applicable under the law. Uh, similar to FIFRA, the legal burden is on the uh, FIFRA registrant to meet the safety standard. EPA isn't tasked with proving that something is harmful the registrant is tasked with proving that it's safe. Uh, and unlike TSCA, FIFRA is a use specific, it's not chemical specific. Um, I think that that proposition is changing now because of the way TSCA is evolving to be very uh, condition of use specific, but certainly with respect to new chemicals and chemicals that are undergoing risk evaluation. But historically that divide has always existed that once you have a, a TSCA chemical that is gone through the new chemical review and approval process and it's placed on the TSCA Section 8 inventory, the chemical is considered safe when, when used. But under FIFRA, every single use of a chemical for every single application is subject to specific EPA approval. Uh, the regulatory framework continues um, to be as it has for many, many years under FIFRA. Uh, the registrant is required to submit lots and lots of data according to different test guidelines that demonstrate that this, this agent that has a, a biological functionality intended to kill, repel, or mitigate is safe when used as intended. Uh, EPA has the discretion to waive some of these requirements uh, for any number of reasons, and it's often one of our jobs we are seeking to get a new or existing um, pesticide product into the market is demonstrate that the agency doesn't need these data uh, because it either already has them or we can extrapolate for other, other data. Um, but it's a very data intensive uh, statute and it can cost millions of dollars to qualify a new chemical or hundreds of thousands of dollars for a biological agent um, because these data are expensive. There are protections for trade secrets similar to FIFRA CBI, uh, but again, the opportunities for um, ensuring that certain information is not made available to the public, those opportunities are more difficult and much more diminished than they have been in years past. And there's a whole different area under FIFRA called FIFRA data compensation. The law, FIFRA, was intended to invite competition. So once a data set is, is available, um, to EPA for review and approval and a pesticide is qualified for use um, after a certain period of time called the exclusivity period, other manufacturers of the same chemical can rely upon the original data set submitted by the third party competitor in order to get their product into the market. But the cost of that is called um, data compensation because you have to pay the, the owner of the data for the right to rely on their data to qualify your chemical. And data compensation is a, a very rich and interesting area of the law. For those of you that like litigation, these are administrative tribunals managed by the American Arbitration Association, but have all the trappings of um, a, a full 
big deal trial. Often data comp arbitrations last three to four weeks, um, are before court reporters, evidence is submitted on the record, and so on and so forth. Very interesting area of intellectual property and uh, business law. Um, your label is considered the law under FIFRA. Every piece of information on what is on this um, image on your screen is scripted by EPA and very heavily regulated. Every single word of the ingredients, uh, your approved claims, um, your use directions, what warning statements with regard to safety um, uh, cautions are are uh, required. That's all highly scripted artwork by EPA and the registrant and subject to lots of different uh, regulations. And you must use your product strictly in alignment with what is spelled out on your label. Uh, new active um, ingredients and products um, and other submissions to EPA are now the subject of prescribed fees and time periods um, brought to you by the Pesticide Registration Improvement Act, or PREA, um, which was entered into law a number of years ago and has provided much more certainty um, and, a, and predictability for the regulated community. Before PREA was invented, if you submitted an amendment to your label, you didn't really have any earthly idea how long it was going to take, which is very difficult to manage from a business perspective. So now if you submit a label claim or if you uh, have a brand new active ingredient, PREA tells you how long and how much it's going to cost to get that um, approved by the agency. So very, very helpful. Um, existing active ingredients are subject to ongoing review and approval, and, and all chemical, all active ingredients have to be re-registered by September 30th, 2022, a goal that EPA is working hard to achieve. All um, active ingredients are subject to re-registration, which means that even though you have an old active ingredient, say a conventional agrochemical substance like chlorpyrifos, bad example because it's heavily litigated, but um, any chemical that has been used for a long time, EPA is constantly reviewing them to ensure that they are managed against current safety standards, okay? Um, as I mentioned, there is a, a category of chemicals called reduce risk. EPA has trying to incentivize the development and, and propagation of safer reduce risk products. Uh, that are subject to less registration or no registration, depending upon how reduced risk that is. Uh, but you do get reduced fees, expedited reviews, and um, specific dedicated resources when the Office of Pesticide Programs to help you get into the market. Lots of different enforcement opportunities under both TUSC and FIFRA. Um, FIFRA in particular is um, very aggressive. EPA has special authorities um, that will restrict future sales of products. Um, there's something called a stop use, stop sale use and removal order, which enables EPA to basically freeze frame the, the, the commercialization of a product or the commercial use of a product and actually compel the recall of product. There are civil and criminal penalties under both TUSC and FIFRA, as you might imagine. Uh, given the nature of what's at stake with regard to pesticides, because these are biological agents intended to kill, EPA has significant enforcement authority and uh, certainly uses it. And again, states that have both mature chemical programs uh, can often require additional or, or um, slightly different information from what EPA requires. And under the FIFRA program, you must have a product approved under the federal program and under every state. Even if there isn't a mature program, you still have to have your registration label approved by the state. And in all but maybe 45 of them, that's largely a ministerial fee generating opportunity. But people often think that once you get your federal label, you're in the market. No, you have to have your state label pretty much in all states in which that product is being um, marketed. What are some of the current FIFRA issues? And this is my last slide. Um, Endangered Species Act. I, I know when um, Alex was um, Assistant Administrator of the Office of Chemical Safety and Pollution Prevention, I'm sure um, ESA issues drove um, uh, Alex crazy as they drive all of us crazy um, in how it meshes with uh, FIFRA. Um, it continues to be a source of considerable consternation and frustration. As I mentioned, registration review is fast approaching. Um, that September 30th, 2022 hard deadline uh, is one the agency is working hard to achieve. Uh, pollinator policy and you know what role, if any, pesticides play in, in bee colony collapse syndrome and other related 
of concerns related to uh, pollinators um, continues to be a hot topic. Um, the interface between Prop 65 warning requirements and FIFRA continues to be an area that for we lawyers or uh, those of us in the regulated community dealing with this continues to be an issue of, of uh, litigation and uh, lack of clarity. And how best to address evolving technologies um, and institutional literacy similar to the uh, industrial chemicals area is one that challenges EPA and I think manufacturers, particularly those inviting the application of new evolving technologies, should be working closely with EPA at every step of the way to make sure that whatever your new evolving technology, whether it's a nano inert or um, a, um, some sort of biological agent with which uh, the agency may be less familiar, you should be working with the agency to help expand that institutional uh, literacy to ensure that newer products uh, that might offer less of an environmental footprint and um, greater efficacy are uh, reviewed and approved according to the highest standards. So I'm going to stop there. We have an opportunity to circle back on these two broad federal statutes um, after both Alex and Angela give their presentations. Thanks so much. Thank you so much, Lynn. We will now turn things over to Alexandra Dunn. So Alex, you are welcome to join the screen and give your presentation now. Thank you all. Thank you so much, Chandler. Can you all hear me and hopefully see me now? Yes, we can. All right. Well, thank you, Lynn. I um, listen to Lynn every time she gives a presentation because she really is uh, so knowledgeable and she breaks down these really complicated statutes into just um, understandable chunks and makes it all sound so reasonable and easy. Um, and so now I'm going to give you a couple case studies which show you that actually um, out in the field, um, things get get pretty hairy and uh, lawyers like Lynn and others uh, help a lot of different entities get through these uh, statutory uh, threading opportunities. They can be really, really challenging. So what we thought we'd do in the chemical space is, is um, both me and the next speaker, I think, are going to give you examples of, of how products are regulated out there in the marketplace using the different laws that, that Lynn just told you about. So I am going to uh, talk to you about a chemical that I hope you've heard about. Um, it's a family of chemicals. Uh, that is broadly known as PFAS, polyfluoral alkyl substances. Uh, there are uh, many members of this family, and I often talk to the talk to people about PFAS like a family. Um, you might have lots of cousins, aunts, uncles, um, relatives, and you're not all the same, even though you're all in the same family. And that is the truth about PFAS. There are about 600 of them in active commerce today and they do not act or behave in the environment all the same way. Um, so uh, let, what are PFAS essentially? PFAS uh, came about, um, and there's a household name that you might have heard of called Teflon. You see that pan down there. PFAS are, um, are carbon bonded uh, fluorine chemicals that prevent things from uh, sticking. They also provide surfaces. Uh, you see it used in firefighting foam. They provide surface coatings. So um, the reason a, a, a PFAS chemistry would be in that firefighting foam is, is for a, an, an oil fire that burns very hot. Uh, you spray a PFAS foam type all over that fire and it sort of creates a, a a cap on it almost where um, it's the oxygen can't get in and the fire is put out. Uh, PFAS are used in food containers. When you pick up that pizza and put it on your lap and the grease from the pizza doesn't soak through the box and get on your um, clothing, that's uh, a PFAS type of coating in a, a food product packaging. Um, you also will find PFAS um, very mobile in the environment. We'll talk a little bit about that. You'll also find them in the medical space. Uh, really, anywhere you may see um, commerce and uh, things that have coatings, uh, electronics, uh, and some other products that we'll talk about here today, 
um, you will find PFAS. Um, the reason there's a cow there is because PFAS um, have been found in dairy milk in uh, cows. PFAS has been found in human blood. Um, really at this point, most of us have been exposed somehow to, to PFAS um, in our existence as, as human beings. And uh, we carry trace elements of PFAS in us as do um, some of our uh, animals and the environment generally. So what I've suggested to you here is that we have a PFAS all over and um, are we concerned? And the answer is, well, yes, we are concerned. Uh, PFAS have been found as far away as the Arctic where we don't really have uh, modern civilization. So they're, they're highly mobile. Thousands of them, as I talk to you, they're like a family, thousands of this chemical family have been out in the marketplace since the 40s. Over 600 are in commerce today. Uh, most of the efforts I'm going to talk to you about are how to manage two members of the family, PFOA and PFOS. Um, and they are the most prevalent and they were um, they are not really made anymore, but they are they have a long legacy and particularly because both are in that triple a triple F firefighting foam, um, you find that anywhere, where there was firefighting activity, drills, um, you could find it at military bases, you can find it at um, uh, industrial facilities, oil and gas manufacturing, uh, firefighting training academies, airports. Um, you'll see a map in a moment that'll give you a sense of, of how widespread these are. Uh, so, um, the other thing that challenges us with responding to PFAS as a chemical, so you're waiting for me to tell you how Tosca, the statute that Lynn just walked you through, will address PFAS, and I will. But um, understanding a chemical is, is one of the major pieces of regulating a chemical. So um, you've heard that they're toxic, you've heard that they're persistent, that they're very mobile. Um, there are some chemicals that go into the environment and they sit in one place. Uh, PFAS aren't like that, they move. Um, they bioaccumulate uh, into uh, species. Uh, I have mentioned they're globally distributed. And then of course, we wouldn't worry at all if there weren't some health effects associated with exposure to them. And right now, unlike some chemicals, as Lynn talked about when EPA is reviewing existing chemicals in commerce, it might be very clear that a chemical is perhaps a uh, carcinogen, is associated with a particular type of cancer. Um, right now, PFAS health effects are very wide ranging. Um, they might affect the immune system. They might be carcinogens. No one has determined that conclusively yet. They may affect various organs in the body or reproductive abilities. So the uncertainty around how they act uh, on the body makes managing them not only important, but also challenging because you have to know what you're trying to control. Generally, you're trying to control and reduce exposure to these. Um, and the only federal level right now that has been set is by the EPA and it's 70 parts per trillion over a lifetime of drinking water. So if in your drinking water source, um, you drank from the same source for 70 years of, uh, for your whole life, uh, and there was over 70 parts per trillion of PFAS detected in that drinking water, we would have concern. Uh, but that number is a very specific exposure scenario. When you talk about chemicals and products, as we're talking today, you're talking about, um, as they say, the dose makes the poison. So how much are you being exposed to? How are you being exposed to it? Are you breathing it in? Is it touching the skin? Is it in the drinking water? Is it in the soil where food is grown? Or um, is it in the animal feed where the cow is, is um, grazing? So again, the pathway of exposure, the route of exposure, and the mode of action is something that we all talk about when we talk about chemicals. And so, of course, we also talk about research and replacing these chemicals with new, um, less toxic, less persistent options. So, Part of what makes the landscape, truly the landscape confusing around PFAS is that there's 
as you can see, a bit of a vacuum from the federal level. We have one number for drinking water, but we don't uh, have much more than that. Well, what happens in a system, a federal system, as we have in our country, is uh, states will step in and act. And so this map, although is too small for you to see all the numbers, will show you that various states have taken action in different ways. And the numbers are very different. I told you 70. If you look here, you see New Hampshire with 12 parts per trillion, uh, and that is in groundwater. Remember the other number I told you about was for drinking water. There's New Jersey now looking at new uh, drinking water with PFOA at 14, PFOS at 13. That's very different than 70. Is New Jersey looking at a different receptor? Are they looking at a child, a younger person? Are they not looking at a lifetime exposure? Are they looking at a shorter period of duration? So as you see this, um, generally the toxicity of PFOA and PFOS is the same. It's not that the different states are assuming it's more toxic. What they're changing is who is being exposed to it and how they're being exposed to it. But the net result is that there are so many different levels that there can be a bit of confusion out there in the regulatory space, as well as consumers wondering if they're in neighboring states like New Hampshire and Vermont. Well, wait a second, is, is Vermont being uh, less protective at 20 than New Hampshire at 12? Well, um, Vermont's is a health advisory, New Hampshire's is for groundwater. Again, we're not comparing apples and apples and people hear PFAS and they hear different numbers and that creates um, a level of uncertainty. Uh, in terms of the types of places where we find PFAS, I think I've already alluded to this fairly well, but um, the purple dots are military sites, the uh, blue dots are where drinking water has high levels over the 70 parts per trillion, and the um, orange dots are um, other known sites. Now, um, these are identified sites where PFAS is a problem. So you would look and say, well, it's in almost every state, at least um, at the military sites, because of that firefighting, uh, you get most of those Western states. But is that, that's where we know it is. This is a map that was just released last week, um, predicting where it could be. And um, what the uh, EWG Environmental Working Group did here is look at the different industries and the activities that used PFAS. And for example, electroplating. And then went ahead and mapped everywhere that those activities took place in the country. So this is a prediction of where we could find PFAS contamination around the country. So this slide where we have found it and this slide where we could find it. But um, certainly there's a lot of different ways to, to display this information to sort of educate people, raise the level of urgency and, and prompt uh, federal action. Again, I just said federal action, but remember, when the federal government pauses or doesn't move quickly enough, states fill the gaps. We've already talked about this, but this will show you here um, that there are states with over uh, 49 adopted policies in 19 states and 96 policies in 50 states. So again, there's policies that are current being contemplated both, but notwithstanding, you see where you sit in the country, as Lynn mentioned, states have a big role in chemical regulation under FIFRA, but they also are stepping in in the area of PFAS. I'm not going to walk through this, but um, I had fun putting it together for you because um, this is just PFAS in the news, if you look almost every single day, you can find an article or a discussion about PFAS. And what's important here is you see the wide range of sources we're thinking about. Remember, this is a case study in a chemical. So you see here that there's a petition with the Food and Drug Administration to ban PFAS from food packaging. You see EPA taking various actions. You see senators in Congress introducing a bill called the No PFAS in Cosmetics Act. You see the Maine governor saying that we should not have in Maine uh, any levels above 20 parts per trillion in uh, drinking water. New Jersey 
excuse me, New Mexico has petitioned the federal government, the governor, to designate PFAS a hazardous waste under RCRA, uh, which is a different statute altogether. Uh, governor petitions get different responses than petitions by you or me. Uh, California saying that carpets containing PFAS are a priority product. Uh, and then even more, um, just today as we sit here, the House is voting on PFAS legislation. Um, we have EPA yesterday proposing to collect data on PFAS in drinking water. Maine passing law to ban PFAS containing products by 2030 and on and on. So again, this is a very volatile area and an example of what happens when a chemical gets in the, the crosshairs of regulators, courts, and scientists. So even here, there's a scientific panel where they're looking for researchers. You have a manufacturer settling with the state of Delaware for liability for contamination. Everybody's looking at this. And again, this is the law of policy, law and policy of products. So you see carpets, you see water, you see food packaging. So this is a really good case study for this summer school session. Now, I'm not gonna go into great detail of how the federal government is regulating because I told you that there's only one number, which is the drinking water lifetime advisory level. But there are multiple statutes, including TSCA, which Lynn talked to you about, um, which can be used to try to regulate and address uh, PFAS. Uh, one of the things that the EPA has done under PFAS is um, just called out to manufacturers to um, voluntarily turn in their licenses, essentially, to make low volumes of certain PFAS. Um, a voluntary program. So again, focusing on the source of the chemical and if we can reduce that source entering into the marketplace. Um, EPA is also under the Toxic Substances Control Act uh, collecting data on PFAS. The agency has a proposed rule out to uh, require PFAS manufacturers to submit studies to the agency on exposures, health effects, workers, um, and a whole bunch of information. So the federal government has lots of authorities that they are using in a whole of government approach to PFAS. And you can see that Administrator Regan, the new head of the EPA, has formed a PFAS action team, as did the prior administration, and the work is continuing. So the whole of government, FDA, the military, the EPA, the Department of Interior, housing, everywhere that people may be, education, uh, all those federal agencies are starting to look at where is PFAS and where might they play a role. Uh, again, I think I've talked to you enough about the different ways that states can regulate PFAS. They can do similar things like the federal government, try to set a drinking water standard, maybe consider it to be a hazardous designation, which would require it to be managed and put in certain types of landfills or restricted in how it can be disposed of. Um, lots of activity as we're talking about products in the area of consumer products and food packaging with various states uh, banning it from food packaging over a period of time. Uh, so when you think of those little food boats, uh, fries, uh, containers, uh, pizza boxes, um, all of that, you will see changes in, as states. And with one state will say it can't, no product in this state can contain PFO or PFOS. Um, then you find that the manufacturers tend to change their manufacturing because they're not going to make a version just for one state versus another. So these state changes, the main ban, the California um, work, may lead to overall marketplace change. Um, just to give you a sense from, from the litigation standpoint, since this is the Environmental Law Institute, um, there's a lot of lawsuits around PFAS as well. Um, for the companies that made PFAS and sold it, like say um, a big chemical company made PFAS um, and they sold it uh, in firefighting foam, uh, those who purchased it are suing them and saying, you know, hey, you sold me a defective product. Um, you, you have to clean it up. You, I didn't know that this was going to happen. You've damaged my property as a result of me using your product contaminated soil, um, even 
common law provisions like nuisance, um, even medical monitoring and injury for workers is being raised in those claims against the PFAS manufacturers. Also, if you were a company or entity that used the PFAS containing product, the same claims are being really brought against these entities. Uh, so really the litigation field is, is wide open um, for those who used PFAS and those who made PFAS, even though they're in different situations from a product standpoint. The product manufacturer has different requirements than the product user, but here the net impact on the environment is almost the same. And for that reason, we're seeing similar claims. There's one very, very large multi-district case over the AFFF firefighting foam, uh, which I'm just going to tell you has over 13,000 cases that have been consolidated all in uh, the, the uh, District of South Carolina federal court. And you can see here, breaking down those 13,000 cases, what are they asking for? They've been brought by water providers saying, company, you've contaminated my water. Um, uh, by putting AFFF, by using AFFF foam. Uh, there's medical monitoring, property damage cases in here, um, all sorts of um, injuries associated with exposure to AFFF. There's even a line of cases involving firefighters uh, who their turnout gear that they wear, um, which obviously PFAS is very good in, in firefighting um, as an anti-flame retardant. Uh, their, their suits that they wore um, exposed them and, um, and they have higher levels of testicular cancer. So there's just all kinds of stuff happening in the litigation area around PFAS. Now, I mostly was talking to you about PFAS and the different laws that EPA can use, including TSCA, to collect information and to authorize. I mean, one thing people are saying is, how do we keep the next PFAS out of the marketplace. Well, that's where EPA under TSCA, the new chemical program that Lynn talked about, the Section 5 program, where companies would come in and say, I'd like to have permission to make this PFAS, and EPA will look at it and have to determine if it's going to pose an unreasonable risk and make that affirmative determination. And then, of course, EPA is getting to over the 40,000 chemicals in commerce under TSCA, EPA will eventually get to assessing existing PFAS. But meanwhile, all this activity is happening around this chemical. And there are probably about 25 other chemicals that are in this hot space. But again, out of the 40,000 in commerce, you're not seeing that much chemical specific activity. Um, there tends to be a movement around a chemical like PFAS. And so I'm just gonna, my last slide here is, yes, there's even PFAS with FIFRA, the other statute that Lynn talked to you about, for chemical regulation, um, FIFRA, as Lynn said, regulates uh, and manages pesticidal products. Well, last fall, uh, an environmental organization uh, found, uh, they, they purchased some uh, mosquito control um, pesticide, which would be diluted and sprayed aerially over um, large numbers of, of communities to avoid um, West Nile, um, in New England area where this came up, there's also a mosquito-borne illness called um, triple E, equine encephalitis. And so uh, the environmental group said, we're gonna buy this and just see what's in it. Obviously it's being sprayed all over our communities. We'd like to know what's in it. And it turns out that they found PFAS in the pesticidal product. Well, PFAS is not an ingredient. Lynn talked to you about FIFRA. FIFRA has a label. EPA has all the information on sort of the recipe for that pesticide. And there was no ingredient on that recipe that would be a PFAS. So how did it get in there? EPA did some studies and research and found that it was probably leaching into the product from the container, the big plastic drum that it was in, uh, which had been treated with a fluorination process um, to make the container less subject to breakage or cracking. Uh, and the result of that may have yielded uh, a PFAS that could chemically soak in to the pesticide product. So EPA um, has done a couple things with this case study here. They've asked states not to spray the existing stock of the mosquito product that they have 
um, if it's been stored in these fluorinated containers. Um, also, uh, using TSCA, back to one of the statutes that Lynn talked about, they've issued an order, that's what's called a subpoena, to the company doing the fluorination to get a little more information about what's actually the fluorination process, how is it that PFAS are being created in this process, how are they breaking away from the the drum and getting into these products. So using the TOSCA Information Gathering Authority, um, using FIFRA um, to, of course, look at what the label is and what's supposed to be in the product. And, um, and then EPA is using its research authorities to continue to do testing and uh, identifying how many different PFAS might be in the product. Um, and this is a, a headline. Um, as you heard, I worked in, in EPA New England. Um, that ran in the Boston Globe. And this is the kind of headline that you'll get with PFAS is these toxic forever chemicals found in pesticide used on millions of Massachusetts acres when spraying for mosquitoes. So um, PFAS is the kind of chemical that your um, a family member might mention to you when they know you do environmental work and say, hey, have you heard of this PFAS? Have you heard what's going on? Um, because it really is in the news every day. And with that, I'll conclude my case study on a product and a chemical and turn it uh, back to Chandler. Thank you so much. Great. Thank you so much, Alex. I really appreciate that. And I thought that was a really nice overview of PFAS. We will now hand things over to Angela to give us an, a larger overview of plastics pollution. So over to you, Angela. Thank you so much. Thank you, Chandler. Um, and thanks to Lynn and Alex. I think Lynn did a great job of doing an overview of the two main laws. Um, and then Alex's case study on, on chemicals and PFAS. I'm similarly going to do a case study on one specific material and um, uh, what's being done about it. So that material is um, plastic pollution. Oops, I think, oh, there we go. Um, well, plastics and how they pollute our environment. So. Uh, I'm the legal director for the Surfrider Foundation. It's an ocean conservation nonprofit organization. Um, and what we're really geared toward is healthy beaches and clean water. So our quintessential grassroots activity is trying to get people out to the beach to do a beach cleanup. And after doing beach cleanups for a decade or so, <laughs> we're, we're over 30 year old organization, um, started noticing that the main material that we're picking up that persists on the beach is plastic pollution. This was combined with uh, Charlie Moore's voyages to the North Pacific gyre and seeing swirls and accumulation of plastic in the ocean. Um, and obviously more and more and more research over the past decade that's really uh, put this uh, issue into the limelight uh, of plastic pollution. So I'm gonna go over um, the extent and uh, potential harms of plastic pollution with a focus on the marine environment um, and then go over some plastics litigation cases uh, of late, and then uh, plastic policy and new legislation. So what's coming up? How do we regulate this? Um, so just starting with uh, plastics in the water, uh, 11 million metric tons of plastic pollution end up in the ocean every year. This is actually upped from an estimate three years ago of 8.8 .8 million metric tons. Um, so it's somewhat getting worse. Um, enough ended up in the ocean in 2010 to equal the weight of 90 aircraft carriers, just to get a visualization of how much is getting into the water. Um, it can be harmful to marine life through entanglement and ingestion, and um, microplastics actually absorb harmful pollutants like pesticides, dyes, and flame retardants, and then can leach them back into the water or into organisms that then uh, eat the, the microplastics and the small plastic particles. So this is just getting an idea for some sources. How does this stuff get into the water? Um, it's a lot of waste and litter from land. Um, urban runoff, uh, there's one watershed, so everything kind of goes from the mountains to streams, uh, is easily blown by the wind, especially with plastic bags, and enters the water. Also, when you have these natural disasters like severe floods and high tide events, tsunamis, hurricanes, that obviously gets a tremendous amount of debris, which enters the water as well. Um, and then just maritime activity, um, uh, I think it's an estimated 20 to 40 percent of uh, plastic is leaked from ships and um, other marine-based sources. Oops, 
the back one. So uh, this leads to ecological impacts, suffocation, starvation, entanglement. I think a lot of people have seen the video of the straw in the turtle's nose, and that has led to regulations such as straw bans or alternative straws upon request, a law that passed in California in 2018. Um, so it led in to a lot of regulation of this one single product. So we've seen single product regulation, bags, straws, sometimes foam, foodware, um, but it's now uh, looking like at the state and even federal level, um, uh, single-use plastics and plastic pollution um, is, is regulated more at a comprehensive level. Let's reduce what we can't, um, what we don't need, reuse what we can, and then recycle the rest. And really trying to put that, we've been saying it for you know a generation, but really trying to create uh, requirements for that and requirements on producers of plastic to do so. Um, another major threat that um, there's a lot of emerging research on is microplastics. So, um, you know, it's been found at the bottom of the Mariana Trench and at the top of the Himalayas. Um, plastics and food, um, salt, honey, beer, um, and in the air we breathe. So there's more and more research and it's, uh, it's getting a little bleaker each time, but <laughs> we know it's out there. Um, we're still finding out what it's doing to us, kind of as Lynn was describing PFAS. Uh, a lot of similar uh, concerns um, in what are the behaviors um, in fish. There was one recent report at the sixth International Marine Debris Conference stating that um, plastic does break the blood brain barrier. Um, and I believe it was a type, type of fish. Um, so, so how is it behaving as a neurotoxin potentially? And this, uh, this just shows a little bit more about how much plastic is entering the ocean. Um, as I said, it's up from that 8 million metric tons to actually 11 now. So this is a, just a few years old. Um, just to put it into context, uh, this is essentially like emptying a garbage truck full of plastic into the ocean every minute worldwide. Um, 322 million tons of plastic were produced in 2015. This is actually 900 Empire State buildings. So that's how much is produced. And only a percentage of that is entering the waste stream, getting in the ocean. Um, but the amount of microplastics in the ocean now is greater than stars in the Milky Way. So those are all ways to just kind of visualize the breadth of the, the issue. And then I think this is the last one on uh, the breadth of the issue. Unfortunately, the United States is the number one producer of, of plastic waste with um, uh, 320 tons of American waste produced in 2016 and 13% uh, of the total waste produced was was plastic. So, you know, we're having the, these huge issues. Um, in 2016, roughly 335 million metric tons of plastic was produced, about half of which was single use plastic. So these are things we're using for a few minutes and then get thrown away. Um, and that just creates a great deal of waste. Uh, Four trillion plastic bags are used annually of which only 1% is recycled. That's from, um, I believe, earthday.org. Uh, these numbers are staggeringly low. I know the recycling rate um, in the U.S. per the EPA's uh, most recent number uh, is hovering around 9% of all plastic being recycled. So let's get into the litigation. Um, so litigation spans uh, Clean Water Act, uh, Clean Water Act discharges, Clean Water Act 303D, impaired water bodies, product liability, misleading consumers, environmental justice and nuisance cases. And I'm just highlighting a few here, but these are some of the most recent and, and largest cases. So this first one is the Texas Formosa um, plastic lawsuit. So there's a there's a plastics plant in Texas on Lavaca Bay um, in Point Comfort that discharged billions of plastic pellets into the bay. Um, just leakage uh, right on the bay. Uh, it was ending up in, in Fisher's um, uh, catches, uh, uh, kids would walk on the bay and, and have it stuck to their feet at, at the bottom of their visit. Um, so it was an undeniable problem. Um, it resulted in the largest ever Clean Water Act settlement filed by a private individual, um, Diane Wilson, and that was uh, on June 26, 2019, so two, two years ago. The financial settlement was styled to fund environmental mitigation in the region around Point Comfort facility in Calhoun County. 
Um, and like I said, the lead plaintiff was Diane Wilson, a former shrimper, and San Antonio Bay Estuarine Waterkeeper. And the Texas Rio Grande Legal Aid was uh, the attorneys. Uh, additionally, uh, like I said, also under the Clean Water Act, uh, there is a 303D uh, mechanism that requires uh, states under the EPA guidance to designate impaired water bodies. Um, so you have a 303D impaired water body listing and requires uh, remediation of those water bodies. How can we get them off the impaired water body list? Um, the lawsuit was by Center for Biological Diversity, Sustainable Coastlines and Surfrider Foundation. Um, we wanted the Department of Health in Hawaii to reconsider which water bodies were listed as plastic, uh, as, as impaired. So not just impaired for enterococcus or other heavy metals, but actual physical microplastic and my macroplastic trash. Um, this resulted in a successful listing of Camilo Beach um, and Turn Island water bodies. Um, Camilo Beach is also nicknamed Plastic Beach. Um, so it's no doubt impaired, and these water bodies are heavily impacted by plastic pollution. Uh, the next case I want to cover is more of an environmental justice case. So this was um, a, a large petrochemical complex proposed for St. James Parish in Louisiana. Um, this is uh, the complex would be sited in the parish's fifth district, where over 90% of the residents are African American. Um, the project site for the plastics facility is 2,400 acres of undeveloped fields and wetlands along the Mississippi River uh, that were the site of two 19th century sugar plantations. In addition to ecological resources and flood protection that would be destroyed, the plaintiffs claim construction would also impact important cultural historic resources, including slave burial grounds. So that's why this lawsuit was filed. Um, under the National Environmental Policy Act. They said that they did not disclose all the environmental damage and public health risks of the proposed plastics facility, um, the National Historic Preservation Act, the Clean Water Act, and the Rivers and Harbor Act. Um, so this is ongoing um, with a preliminary injunction filed uh, July 2020 that led to the agreement for a temporary cease of construction. Um, so this is something we're seeing that's new, that's really targeting uh, plastic production, especially in these areas that are already impacted and have environmental justice um, concerns. And then the final slide for um, plastics litigation. Uh, this kind of talks about another vein where we're seeing more and more litigation, um, misleading consumers, product liability, and nuisance. Um, so the first uh, lawsuit uh, was against, it was a class action uh, with named individuals against Carrig Cup, those little cups that you use to make your coffee, especially in hotels, um, which you think are recyclable because they say that they're recyclable. But it turns out they're functionally not recyclable because once they get to the recycling facility, the MRF, um, they are too small to be um, put within the functional recycling uh, system. So um, there the class was certified uh, in September 2020, and I believe that case is ongoing as well. Um, also have a Cindy Baker read Nestle for false advertising, um, challenging claims of Nestle Pure Life water bottle due to microplastics found in bottled water. It's about the same as what's found in tap water. Um, so this was voluntarily dismissed in February 2019, but you're seeing what kind of cases are being filed here. And then the Earth Island Institute has filed two recently, um, one in February 2020, a very large suit. Um, it's one of the most comprehensive we've seen so far against major food, beverage, and consumer product businesses for the harms of plastic pollution within the environment. Um, in addition to public nuisance, the complaint also alleges breach of warranty, negligence, negligence uh, failure to warn, strict liability failure to warn, strict liability product defect, and violations of the California Consumer Legal Remedies Act. Um, the plaintiffs followed a vein of similar efforts to sue large oil companies and tobacco companies for knowingly um, putting out public harms and simultaneously obfuscating those harms, um, saying it's recyclable and they know the extent of damage that's being done. Um, specifically, the complaint calls out the defendant's decades-long campaign of misinformation about recyclability of their products and the resultant costs to consumers and public entities. Um, so we're seeing a lot more of this in the latest one they filed just last month um, in June, 2021. So this was not in California, which the rest were, um, it was in DC. 
and it was for false and deceptive advertising claims against Coca-Cola specifically. Um, so instead of naming 10 brands, they focused on Coca-Cola. Um, it was in the DC Superior Court under DC's Consumer Protection Act. Um, and they called out things uh, like Coca-Cola's uh, touting of a world without waste, a marketing campaign, as specifically greenwashing. So I think it was Lynn, Lynn mentioned the FTC green guides. Um, that's something that's at play in the Kerrig suit. And I believe this, this Coca-Cola one as well. Okay, well, without further ado, I will get into plastics legislation and just kind of give you a flavor for what's going on out there. There's a ton going on. <laughs> a lot at the state level, um, local level, there's still a lot going on as well. And then at the federal level, and like I said, it's been going from product by product to comprehensive regulation of, of all plastics. So the policy approaches. Um, California was the first to, to do a statewide plastic bag ban after over 100 municipalities had already done local bag bans. Um, it was passed in 2014, but it was put on a referendum ballot and, um, and then uh, voted in by all the voters in 2016. So it went into law in 2016. And now, lo and behold, there are 11 states, um, with Colorado being the latest last month, uh, banning bags, putting a fee, or some type of regulation on single-use plastic thin bags. Um, also statewide, there are eight states that have uh, banned foam, that expanded polystyrene foam that can break down into small pieces and last hundreds of years. Uh, we see, find that a ton on the beach as well. So Washington and Colorado were the latest to um, ban foam. And then we're seeing comprehensive legislation and federal legislation. This is just a little bit about how uh, the, the bag bans work. Um, the Cal Recycle State Agency in California did do an assessment of how the bag ban was working, I think a year after um, it was put into place. And they found that 86% <laughs> of, um, of people that went to the store do, do not need a bag. They brought their own bag because they didn't wanna be charged 10 cents for a paper bag or, or a reusable bag. 11% um, uh, of them did, forgot their bag and, and would need it, but 86% but either brought their own bag or didn't need one. Maybe they were having such a small transaction, they didn't need one. And this uh, just shows nationwide. Um, I thought Alex did a great job with her, her slides showing what's happening nationwide on um, regulation. So what we're seeing is in addition to these um, 11 states that have banned bags, which you'll see in the dark blue, um, there's also states that not only don't ban bags, but they prohibit localities from doing so. So these cities that want to ban bags, they're saying, no, you can't do that. Florida was the first to say no. We preempt at the statewide level, we have control of whether or not bags are banned. Um, and that's what you see in the orange there. So we have a pretty divided nation, I would say, um, on this issue. And that's just bags, that's not all plastic. Um, but like I said, now it's getting more comprehensive. And what we have are laws that are trying to hold producers of the products responsible for the litter and trash they create. Um, and that's called extended producer responsibility. That's a that's a um, liability scheme that's been used for carpets and uh, sharps, needles, and several other products, product by product, tires. Um, but now we're seeing it being used for plastic packaging and single-use plastic uh, foodware. And uh, just days ago, Maine became the first state in the U.S. to pass an extended produ producer responsibility law for plastic packaging and all packaging. Um, so it requires the Maine Department of Environmental Protection to start the rulemaking process in 2023 and has big co corporations reimburse towns for the cost of managing wasteful packaging materials. So it creates a stewardship organization that collects monies from the producers and the packagers and gives it to the municipalities that are already cleaning up the waste. Um, so the fees are based on the amount and type of packaging sold. Um, it really incentivizes producers to minimize the packaging and the waste they create. And um, participating cities will have to take a standardized list of recyclables. So not only do they help clean up the litter and the trash, they have to accept the recyclables curbside. And um, the funds are used for waste reduction, education, infrastructure. Um, and we're really, it's trying to get uh, towns to go uh, less plastic and uh, more ocean friendly, and especially the producers of that waste. Okay, I know I'm getting into the, the home stretch here. Um, 
But I did wanna go over a little bit of what else is being proposed. Uh, this main law is probably one of the most exciting. Um, in California, they've been trying to do a comprehensive law for a few years, um, failed to pass last year by four votes in the assembly. Um, and that led to um, over 20 laws being, being um, uh, introduced this year. So I'm just gonna give you a flavor for what those types of laws are. Um, you're seeing this requirement that foodware accessories can only be provided upon request. A lot of you may have drawers full of takeout wear forks and knives, especially after the pandemic, um, you know, you're getting all this stuff to take home anyway, but hey, I already have silverware at home, like most people. So um, you really don't need that. So it's just making sure, just like the straws upon request law, you know, we don't need utensils and stirs and everything else, um, just minimizing that, that trash that's just handed out every day. Um, another really interesting one that leads to transparency is AB 881 is, is trying to, require that the export of recyclable waste is actually recycled. So it's not letting um, uh, the recyclers and the manufacturers count uh, the, the export of waste as recyclable unless it actually is recycled. So it's, it's a reform on, on what can be used towards the recycling portfolio and, and what they're counting as what's recycled. Because a lot of times it's going to other countries that may ship it to a third country, and then it's being piled up in a landfill right near the ocean and, and leaking into the ocean. Also, there's a law for truth in recycling. So when something has a chasing arrow on it, a lot of people think that means it's, recy it's recyclable. A lot of times it is not. If it's a higher number plastic or the municipal recycling might only take one or twos. Um, so this really calls for that chasing arrow to not be used or to only be described um, only be used when it's recyclable. Um, also creating a system for returnable, refillable bottles and phasing out the packaging peanuts and all that film plastic you get with e-commerce, which also had a huge bump these past couple of years due to the, to the pandemic. Um, a few more here, this is a lot of info, but trying to get Californians to buy recycled, more minimum recycled content and what's being bought. Um, uh, disposable wipes, there's actually a federal bill that's um, being introduced on this as well. Um, making sure that disposable wipes are not labeled with, um, are, are labeled do not flush. So um, they, people know that they can't uh, flush it down the toilet and create wastewater backup and um, more plastic because a lot of times they have that tinsel or plastic that goes into the waterways. Um, standardization for compostability is really important. Um, assessing microfibers, trying to filter it out from not just dryers, but also washers, because that rinsed wastewater can get, um, can lead to a lot of microfibers in, in our wastewater system. And then opposing putting plastic, reused plastic in the roads. Uh, there's a really good study by Unomia in, uh, in Great Britain showing that a huge source of microplastics in waterways is from tires. Um, so if we make roads out of it, you're basically just doubling that. Um, and just to finish up here, we have a lot going on at the local level, the federal level, the Break Free from Plastic Pollution Act um, is a huge bill uh, that has EPR, bag fees, uh, national container deposit law, ban on foam, um, requires recycled materials, and a, in Surfrider's opinion, a great federal law to kind of address um, many, many aspects of the plastic pollution issue. And then just uh, a couple thoughts on regrettable alternatives. So a lot of times we're seeing, oh, we'll just ban this. If this is bad, we'll ban it, we'll ban it. But it's leading to potentially something worse, um, just as bad or worse. So when you're banning single-use thin bags, um, manufacturers are maybe making thicker bags that are then given away for free. And um, you know that if they get in the ocean, it's more plastic in the ocean. They may not be able to blow in the wind quite as easily, but um, still not a good alternative. We want people to have reusable bags, uh, truly reusable. Um, and then lining with, uh, instead of PFAS, um, maybe lining products or the Teflon um, pans or um, you know Coca-Cola bottles with uh, PFOA, so, some other alternative that is a chemical that's potentially just as bad, but we just don't know about it yet. And then we have to be on the watch for plant-based or sustainable products. There's a lot of greenwashing potentially out there. Um, 
uh, a lot of times bioplastics behave, especially in the ocean, the same way that regular plastics do. They break down at a slow rate and they persist and can be ingested and potentially uh, transport chemicals. So all of those harms could be available um, uh, with, with bioplastics as well. Um, so what we'd, we'd like is just encouraging potentially compostable products. Um, and there is an ASTM standard. Uh, it's probably okay for products like compostable foodware that receive an ASTM D6400 certification in jurisdictions where curbside commercial composting programs accept these products. Um, so we're getting there. We do need a lot more standardization. We need to understand how these products behave in the environment a lot better. Um, and, and that's kind of where the industry is going when you can't have reusables, what type of single use might be okay. And that that wraps up my presentation. Thank you all for your time. Well, thank you so much, Angela. And thank you so much to all of our excellent presentations this afternoon. We will now move right into our Q&A session. And just as a reminder to our participants, please do enter your questions using GoTo's question box. Um, I think one of the, the things I take away from this is just how large this space is. I think, I think this is really nicely demonstrated with our three presentations. Lynn giving us the overview of chemical policy and regulation, then Alex giving us a, a case study within that realm, and then Angela showing how plastics is also involved in this. Um, and I think this first question really nicely ties those three very large and probably individual topics together. Um, the question starts by saying um, the pandemic has presented an apparent tension between sustainability and human health, um, such as with the increased usage of single use plastics and also chemical products um, for cleaning. So this first, it could be a multi-part question. This first part of the question is, um, is this a fair dichotomy between human health and sustainability or put differently, does this dichotomy actually exist? So I'll throw this out to anyone who wants to take a stab at it. Um, and, and then depending on your answers, there might be some, some additional questions to that. Well, maybe I could just kick off a little bit because I'm, I'm not sure I accept the premise that cleaning products per se necessarily are to be juxtaposed or are inconsistent with sustainability or public health. Um, a lot of cleaning products um, and a lot of the trade associations that have re-engineered uh, cleaning products to be more sustainable uh, and less of an environmental footprint issue, um, I think needs to be recognized. Um, and like I'm a philosophy major, as Aristotle said, all things in, in moderation, right? Uh, the use of cleaning products um, judiciously used can go a long way in ensuring public health. Uh, they're already very heavily regulated. Um, and I, I just wanted to make sure that we're all on the same page regarding that dichotomy. I would defer in a heartbeat to Angela and, and Alex with regard to single-use plastics. I, I know I'm a, a vigorous opponent of them, and the, as Angela's very uh, detailed explanation provided, there are a million different ways to get around that, and, and the public needs to be aware of the mischief caused by single-use anything, plastics in particular, particularly when there are so many workarounds. But you're right, Chandler, whoever asked that question brought to mind a very important um, added element in, in the conversation regarding what do we do when takeout is much more common than uh, seated being seated in restaurants and single-use anything. Um, you know, is to be avoided at all costs. So I'll yield and, and ask Angela and, and Alex to weigh in. Yeah, I might just chime in. And I, I was thinking also, it's a good question because it poses, I think, some big thoughts. And one thing I'll say is having worked at the EPA through the, the, the onset of the pandemic, mm -hmm. um, and this goes back to FIFRA, Lynn, and you might have some thoughts here, one thing we did see is um, a lot of what we would call novel products being presented to EPA for registration. And it became quite apparent that FIFRA is not a statute that moves quickly, you know, for, for all kinds of good reasons, right? We wanna, we wanna really double check any chemical, right? Before it enters the marketplace so that we don't have regrettable alternatives as Angela mentioned. But 
We also found, for example, on the on the waste issue, um, there were companies that had innovative technology that could disinfect um, uh, gowns, hospital attire, uh, masks, um, all all sorts of ways to perhaps uh, reduce um, waste ending up in you know the ocean or other places. And I know. I saw during the pandemic, and we've probably all noticed the number of paper masks on the ground, like just the waste that became apparent once everyone was going out with masks. I don't understand why people were just tossing them or dropping them, but they were everywhere, right? I mean, like in my neighborhood, you walk where I walk my dogs, I can probably on every walk find a mask discarded on the ground, paper mask. Um, and we were not able to quickly register as many of these novel products as possible. And I did think, and I'm still thinking about the fact that FIFRA was written in the 1940s. Um, it hasn't really been significantly overhauled. Lynn has a lot of expertise in nanotechnology and innovative technologies. And I do think that the questioner makes me reflect on using the time between emergencies to, to maybe improve the legal structure that we have to work under so that we are better positioned to respond when things are unexpected. So it's not exactly an answer to their question, but it's what their question made me think about. Yeah, I, I would say it's definitely a, a great question as well because it's something that, um, you know, I think in, in working in the plastics realm, we struggled with, you know, and, and just in everyday life, can you bring your reusable coffee mug anymore? As I've been doing for many years, mm -hmm. um, because then if, if you might have COVID, you could be giving it to the barista, which of course employees don't wanna do. So you almost got into employment law um, and worker health at that point. Um, but if you're getting a styrofoam cup instead, what kind of chemicals does that have that's getting into your body? So um, it's it's definitely a balance. Um, and uh, yeah, something we all, we all had to grapple with. Um, we did do a little bit more research on, on a transfer through fomite, uh, through touch. And I think we learned a lot more during the pandemic. Uh, you know, COVID is, is a lot less transmissible outdoors. Um, through touch is, is less than 5% of the cases, but still something you want to be concerned about. Um, I turned into a clean freak, so I wanted everything to be <laughs> you know, like, and um, I think Lynn brought up a good point. Um, vinegar is a cleaning agent, and I think, you know, that that's okay. There are some some very good cleaning agents that could be used, um, and we just want to make sure we're, we're doing what's on balance the most healthy. Well, I think those are all really nice responses, and I, I do think it is an interesting question. Um, we have a question here for FIFRA. So, Lynn, I'll start with you on this one, but anyone who wants to jump in on it, please feel free to do so. Um, the question asks, asks, how does EPA account for changes in chemical composition that occur during the mixing process? An example of such a reaction is, um, I'm going to not pronounce this correctly, so I apologize, uh, trimethyl, trimethyl C? what when mixed with water um, would become a hydroxy version should a csf and label both represent the end product you know that's that's a great question and i think that's an issue that i will want alex to opine on too being uh, head of the fifra and and the tosca offices but you know the way the the fifra registration process works is that every step of the manufacturer um, and uh, use of the chemical are really considered by EPA when registering a product. So that CSF or a confidential statement of formula really um, should address or at least EPA's review of a chemical and its use would anticipate the generation of impurities, byproducts, or even new chemical moieties that might be derivative of that mixing process. Um, FIFRA is not a, not a statute that allows for um, any margin of, of, of mystery <laughs> and, and any deviation from the process that has been submitted to EPA with regard to its manufacture, where it is manufactured, the equipment used during the manufacture, and then what happens once it is being used that might give rise to the generation of a new chemical or a, um, 
um, uh, impurity or byproduct uh, would be part of that review process. Um, and if something were to come um, known, become known to the registrar after uh, the product has been approved, you would have an obligation or EPA would be of the view that under FIFRA section 6A2, you would be obligated to share that information very quickly with the agency to ensure that its presence, whatever that new substance or byproduct or contaminant or impurity might be, uh, is of a benign nature and wouldn't give rise to anything that approached the unreasonable risk uh, standard that, that EPA has under FIFRA. But Alex, that might have come up during your tenure when you were chief honcho over there, but that, that's my <laughs> take on that. Yeah, I, Lynn, I think you answered the question correctly that um, the agency should be aware of those um, chemical reactions and accounting for them in the process of registration. So um, maybe the question is asking about like transparency and, and um, how do people become aware of all these different possible reactions and mm -hmm. And that that you know that probably there's room to improve uh, public availability of information and accessibility to information, um, but but the CF the CSFs confidential statements of formula. I don't believe those are publicly available. No, that's that's like the holy grail. Those are the key. The key are they? Oh, you never share that. I don't think so. Right. Right. You so, know, to, to yeah, your, yeah, yeah. I just want to, I just want to confirm well, that. I mean, that's that's the recipe. That's the right. recipe. So, it's, yeah. But you you wouldn't. Um, what you know? The, the question also invites consideration of what is the relevance of whatever that newness is that arises with the mixture of a, of a, a yeah. chemical, right? I mean, if it if it poses any type of biological threat or unreasonable adverse effect, there are other provisions of TSCA that require the compelling of that disclosure to EPA, which, which would be in a quasi-public context, or might require you know, additional provisions or warning requirements, depending upon what it is that is determined. But so it, it'd be interesting to engage with whoever asked that question, mm -hmm. what angle is it is intended to yeah. I, I thought that, or risk. Mm -hmm. Right. I, I I agree. I agree. And and Alex, I was going to circle back to your question or the the case study that you presented with regard to the um, PFAS contamination and agrochemical based on you know the, the containers and the leaching of PFAS. I mean that was pretty much a little bit of this. Um, situation right who knew that the product could be contaminated or to use the FIFRA term adulterated with a chemical substance that was not part of the csf and once epa became aware of that it arguably inspires a 6a2 reporting obligation and arguably um will require you know the cessation of the use of that type of of um fluorinated plastic containers, even though they do offer an opportunity for enhanced plastic use in the agrochemical sector, which really was a goal of the EPA because of some of the issues regarding uh, metal uh, containers in the agrochemical. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think this whole, and I got to notice that I had a slow connection. Can you all hear me okay? Mm -hmm. Okay, um, so one thing that, and uh, you know, maybe turn it to Angela too. There's, uh, there's so much push pull in the area of products, right? Because we try to fix one problem and then we sort of end up sometimes creating another problem. And Lynn's exactly right. The the reason that packaging for the agricultural chemicals was was changed was because metal drums can rust, can leak, and some of these chemicals, particularly something like a mosquito side might be purchased in bulk by a community, a town department of public works and kept in storage for, you know, through the winter, but ready for springtime and, and then result in, you could have a chemical spill or a chemical leak. And so we say, let's change to these, um, these, these uh, less 
uh, rust prone containers well, then we end up with a new problem. And Angela, I thought you made that point really well with the regrettable alternative slide that I, I, I like that phrase. I, I think it's spot on, you know, it's well intentioned, but it's 2020 hindsight, maybe not the best outcome. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, working with um, surf industry with Surfrider, you know, they're saying, well, we need this functionality. You know, we, we need to be able to um, package our products. What can we put them in? And even even going from plastic bags to paper bags, I mean, cutting down trees is not good either. <laughs> so yeah. so you really have to do the cost benefit analysis of, of each product um, and, and learn about the potential harms and the extent of harms of each product. Mm -hmm. um, Angela, we have a question that is geared towards you. Um, the question asks, do you think that the false advertising slash greenwashing products cases that you had highlighted are going to be successful? And I'm assuming by successful, they mean um, the companies that are allegedly misleading um, will lose, but I will turn that one over to you for your thoughts. Yeah, I mean, I, I, I think they're very interesting to watch and, and I think it, it is good claims. Obviously, it's a case of first impression, um, really testing out how far the law can go in regulating uh, these manufacturers. Um, and uh, like I said earlier, they're really trying to go down the vein of um, taking on big tobacco and big oil. So, so taking on big plastic for things that um, have been quantified. So how much, how many Coca-Cola products have been found in the environment? Well, they're starting to do brand audits when they uh, do beach cleanups. Um, so, you know, there's good evidence, there's laws that need to be tested and I, I definitely think it could go somewhere. Yeah, um, I'll chime in on that. Uh, we have uh, a lot of um, clients at our firm that are that are looking at these developments with the greenwashing cases. And Lynn, I'm so glad you mentioned the FTC green guides. You know, when people think about regulating the environment, they tend to think about EPA. And one thing that we've been telling companies is you really need to think about the, as I mentioned, the whole of the federal family that plays here. And the Federal Trade Commission and um, Angela mentioned the case brought under DC consumer protection law. So we have state law as well. So, you know, important lesson for our attendees is, is not everything is federal. There's, there's federal and state requirements and it's not always done at the EPA. And I think I agree with Angela, it's a very interesting trend to take these green guides, which um, I took a, a little quiz of whether I thought a statement was misleading or not. And I will tell you that I did not fare too well on that quiz. Um, statements like uses 25% less packaging than, um, than our, our prior bottle have been found by the FTC to be misleading because um, they, the, that's not actually the case, right? And so a lot of these statements, um, biodegradability, is now being questioned because there's PFAS on the product. And so you might have a biodegradable food boat, uh, but if it's got PFAS on it, it's still maybe leaving, the allegation is that it's leaving an environmental harm. It's leaving a chemical in the environment and that, that means it's not fully biodegradable because there's at least one part of it, the chemical coating that might be in the environment, might be in the environment forever. So there's really a fascinating development around products and the chemicals that interface with these products and people wanting to make purchases to be a responsible consumer, uh, they're trying to do the right thing. And now these companies are sort of being held to an elevated standard that um, environmental groups are really um, pushing quite, ha quite hard. I, I think you so. Uh, I think the body of law is gonna really build. It's gonna build, go ahead, Lynn. Well, I just wanted to supplement your comment on the um, really extraordinary opportunities under federal law. I mean, FIFRA has a comparative claims provision too. You can't say under the FIFRA implementing regulations, for example, at the federal level that your product is more efficacious or kills better than brand X, that's, that's a no-no. And you've got you know 50 state consumer protection laws 
and, and states are getting really frisky ramping up their use of state consumer protection laws to address misleading marketing claims, whether they go to efficacy or toxicity or recyclability, you know, what have you. Um, state activists are using those types of claims and those types of tools. And the, the law I mentioned when I talked about the Illinois Detergents Act, for example, that has the, these volumetric thresholds, they, these are being used both by NGOs in business interests to bring claims uh, to ultimately deselect the chemical that the volumetric limitations are intended to, to address. So the, the area of environmental claims at the federal, state, and local level, and state-specific claims and laws that similarly manage and diminish and regulate claims are just, it just goes to how explosive this area is. There's a little bit of something for everyone at the local, mm -hmm. federal, state um, level. And, and it's not relenting one bit, even with new Tosca, or even if, if, if Alex were to get her wish, if we had a new FIFRA that uh, addressed more specifically some of the technological innovations that the existing statutes are very difficult to, to address, um, there's no diminished um, growth in state and local initiatives in this chemical product space. And I'm so glad you mentioned FIFRA and the claims, uh, because again, going back to COVID, um, right. I think a lot of people woke up to the fact that FIFRA, everything you say about your product, uh, we companies were, there was a peak in enforcement around many companies who were making claims that they didn't have the scientific data to back up that the product was effective against the SARS-CoV-2 virus. Um, mm -hmm. Uh, claims around how long lasting the product could kill. We had uh, uh, cases come into the EPA where, you know, they say you spray it and it kills the virus for seven or eight or 30 or 100 days. Um, so really good point that FIFRA does every claim in made about the efficacy of the product is validated by the EPA. I'll just say, um, and I know we Oh, sorry. <laughs> well, talking about FIFRA and, and TESCA, um, I know with uh, plastics as well, what, what maybe hasn't been tested but been, has been thought about quite a bit is the Endangered Species Act, Marine Mammal Protection Act, mm -hmm. even the Clean Air Act that we're finding uh, microplastics in the air, um, and CERCLA for um, a release uh, of chemicals as uh, leaching is included within the release. So um, I think there's there's more to be tested here. and from my vantage point, um, the good thing about litigation is it's forcing new policy. And I think industry recognizes that and wants to act um, to shield themselves from future liability, um, but also for the PR value now that um, a, a lot of people know about this and are seeing more of the, the harms of plastic pollution. Mm -hmm. Thank you so much. Um, we have a pretty interesting uh, procedural question. and. It's not directed towards anyone, but I think, Alex, you might be the best person to start us off on this. Um, the question, it, it's relating to um, Lynn's presentation. Lynn had mentioned the, the registration review deadline of September 30th, 2020 for, um, for FIFRA. And the question asks, what will happen if EPA fails to meet the registration review deadline for FIFRA? Uh, I, um, oh, yeah, no, I can definitely add because when I was at EPA, that question was projected out. It's actually 2022. Um, all uh, chemicals registered under FIFRA, all active ingredients, of which there are 735 active ingredients, approximately 730 registered active ingredients, have to be re reviewed by EPA every 15 years. Um, and so EPA is always in a process of working on a bucket of these because you, you don't pick up all 725 and, and start them and take 15 years and then start again, right? So there's always uh, chem chemicals, active ingredients coming up for a review. Um, EPA has projected that it will um, not complete all of them by the 2022 deadline. So to your procedural question as to what happens, um, nothing really happens other than, you know, EPA keeps working on getting it all done. And um, the agency could have a 
lawsuit brought for failure to meet the statutory deadline, in which case the agency would be put under a schedule by a court to complete the work. Um, last I was in the agency, um, the agency was pretty close to, to getting the work done. Um, also, um, any kind of lawsuit would be a citizen suit. As, as Angela knows, it would have a 60 day notice period uh, before it could even be brought. Um, and you know, depending on where the agency was, sometimes it's quite possible they could finish the work in those 60 days, although I doubt it. Um, but there's not gonna be hundreds left to be done. The, if, you, if you watch, the agency is regularly posting uh, the three steps of re-registering, which is a draft environmental, ecological and human health as assessment. Those are two, two risk assessments. So they read you the science on the chemical, then they, they read you the, the, um, the registration and, and, and how it's used, and then they go ahead and re-register it. So it's a three-step process. Yeah, Lynn. I, Alex, you, you're exactly right. The last time I talked to my, my colleagues at OPP, the Office of Pesticide Programs, I thought they were pretty confident that that target was going to be reached. But in the event that it is not, you know, any entity wanting to get grumpy about that would obviously have the option of filing a suit for failure to meet a statutory deadline. Whether or not that would be time and money well spent, of course, is another issue. Um, given the yeoman's job that our colleagues at EPA performed in perfecting and approving and managing some of the COVID-19 issues that you alluded to, Alex, you know, mm -hmm. I think EPA staff is to be congratulated for the extraordinary job they did under your leadership, Alex, um, in managing all of the new products and um, applications and uses that uh, some in the community sought to use their registered products for COVID related applications. So if you, when you consider the big picture, EPA had all of that to deal with in 20, you know, late 2019, 2020 and 2021 to now and, and ongoing given, given Delta um, and meeting the statutory deadline of re-registration by September 30, 2022. Um, EPA has just done a remarkable job very, very busy space. We have time for a couple more questions. Um, this next question, I think is a really interesting one. I'm gonna uh, reword it slightly, but um, Angela, maybe, maybe we start with you on this one. Um, this question asks, first, I'm gonna restate it and say, do you think there has been an over-focus on single-use plastics and straws and if so, has that allowed corporations to take su uh, superficial action on climate change without making larger scale changes? Yeah, very interesting question. Um, an overreaction, I, I think, you know, straws really got in the, the zeitgeist and were really top of mind and the turtle picture just exploded. Um, and whereas we thought, you know, bags were kind of the tip of the iceberg that everyone would pay attention to, really, I think, I think it was straws and I think single-use plastic is just such a tangible thing everybody sees it and it, you encounter it every day I try to avoid single-use plastic and yet you're kind of bombarded with it it's food packaging so it just leads people to wonder what's what's in that food packaging um, and so yes I would say no I don't think it's been <laughs> talked about too much and um, it still is um, a major source of litter it's actually um, the bulk of what we find on our beach cleanups is, is food packaging and um, plastic fragments, so the breakdown of, of food packaging. Um, as for how it interplays with climate, um, I don't think the Biden administration has ignored climate. I think <laughs> uh, that was definitely the, the first 100 days, um, the environmental topic uh, they, they want to talk about and, and deal with um, quite a bit. Um, we know that uh, the uh, the EPA has a trash free seas program, so they are, um, you know, paying attention to this and um, uh, we're, we're waiting for them to take larger actions that potentially I could report during the next webinar. <laughs> but um, they, uh, the, yeah, I, I don't think it's necessarily competing as much as we think it is. In fact, a lot of groups are, are looking for the, the overlap and um, plastic production, plastic comes from natural gas and oil. 
Um, so it's another use of fossil fuels, um, which is an overlap. Also, when plastics break down, they emit greenhouse gases. Um, there's more research being done on that. So um, it's it's an it's another kind of brand of environmental uh, problem um, or segment, uh, but it overlaps with climate and um, and ultimately it's use of our natural resources in a, in a smart and um, a way that that um, enables good stewardship of our resources. So so there is overlap and hopefully it's not necessarily competing as much as um, drawing attention to to how we need to protect our natural resources. We have time for one, maybe two more questions, and if we're quick on this one, but um, I think this question might best be started with Lynn. Um, the question asks, how do Tosca and FIFRA, FIFRA apply to industrial chemicals or pesticides that have already contaminated the environment? Hmm. Well, um, pesticides that are approved and are used and might be found in soil, for example, um, I'm, that is not necessarily a issue. There might be other regulatory um, issues dealing with soil impregnated um, with pesticides for purposes of, of RICRA disposal, for example. Some, some active ingredients, for example, are considered listed hazardous waste under RICRA. And so if you spill a pesticide inadvertently and you have contaminated debris, it would probably be, I think it's an F listed, if I can recall my, my uh, FIFRA mm -hmm. background, which is about 10 billion years old now. Alex, you might know, or, or Angela, but um, <laughs> you know, an application there, but, um, and, and similarly, TSCA doesn't regulate, except in the PCB section 6E of TSCA, um, there are specific, very, very um, granular, provisions that apply to the disposal of PCB contaminated debris, depending upon what the concentration is of the PCB and the type of PCB it is. So I, there's some tangential applications in that context, but by and large, FIFRA and TSCA deal with industrial and agrochemical uh, products as they are um, imported, uh, manufactured and used. And then there are largely, except for the provisions I noted, other regulatory statutes that are intended to deal with end of life contaminated debris and soil. But Alex, Allardale, you might have a, a different perspective on that. It, I, I agree that TSCA is not a air quote cleanup statute, you know, as, as you would think. It does have a, a pollution prevention piece to it. So, mm -hmm. but the questioner was saying, what do you do about what's already out there? Well, look at the PFAS case study. I mean, you do a lot about what's already out there. You, you, you try to, um, stem the continued release, you try and get to the source, you try and um, there have been remediations ordered to clean up PFAS contamination. So so I think um, the, the, the focus of Tosca and FIFRA, as Lynn points out, is, is um, before the product enters the marketplace, you know, having EPA put eyes on all of the possible uses and, and Tosca requires, amended Tosca requires a look at all reasonably foreseen conditions of use. So not only how the applicant says, I'm, make, I'm presenting to you this chemical and I wanna use it as a coating, uh, a paint coating. Uh, EPA can then look at that chemistry and say, ah, well that could also be used in five other ways. And the agency will look at all those reasonably foreseen conditions of use as well. Um, sometimes to the frustration of the applicant uh, because they say, well, I'm not going to do that. I just am going to make this paint coating. Why are you bringing up all these other things that could happen? But that's what the agency is trying to do and has been asked to do under TSCA is think about um, what could happen before it happens. Right. Well, unfortunately, it looks like we are out of time. Um, Lynn, Alex, and Angela have masterfully covered a whole huge area of environmental law here in just under two hours. So 
Um, just really first want to say thank you to each of them. I've really enjoyed these presentations in this Q&A session. Um, and also just wanna say thank you so much to our participants for joining us today and for your many thoughtful questions. We hope you'll continue to watch the foundations of environmental law, especially law and policy of products regulation. Um, again, we want to remind you to join us for next Tuesday for the final session of our summer school, which will be environmental justice. Another mm -hmm. thank you to Lynn, Alex, and Angela. You each contributed so much and thank you for lending your expertise to summer school. Thank you all so much. Please take care and stay safe. And thank you for joining us today. Thanks Thank all. Thanks, Chandler. Bye. Bye, all. Bye.